boys just coming, let's come. Yeah, human, right? It's not, it's not, I mean, it's hot, but human. We're going to begin our Do you want to lecture a, yeah. now. Yeah, please. That'd be great. We're going to continue our theme of recent weeks, which has been discussing the eight aspects of the path. or what's called in Buddhism the Eightfold Path. There are, in the teachings of Buddhism, we know that there are four noble truths. There are four essential laws which govern the nature of the path, the nature of the work that we have to perform. The first one of those is that life is suffering. And we can see that quite easily when we examine the life of any person. But of course, that'll become most real, most concrete when we examine our own lives. And in previous lectures, we've discussed the nature of suffering and the types of suffering. And with practical work on oneself, with the activation of the the keys and clues that are given in this tradition, it becomes a matter of personal knowledge and personal experience to see that suffering is indeed all-pervasive. Not only in our own lives, but in the lives of everyone around us. And the perception of that truth is very difficult to digest. The perception of that truth is one thing, and the digestion of it is another. To really comprehend the nature of suffering and to comprehend the scope of suffering requires a great deal of honesty and it requires a great deal of courage. The mind that we have, the ego that we have, prefers not to see that because the ego, our own sense of self, has certain goals and certain ways of doing things that are very much contradicted by the fact of suffering. But nonetheless, those who are inquiring about the path, who are inquiring about how to improve their own lives in a real fundamental way, today, not just as an idea, but to actually achieve it, those people come to find that there are practical steps there is actually a way to overcome suffering. And that, of course, is the fourth noble truth, which is that there is a way to overcome suffering. The Buddha, when he taught those four truths, expressed that fourth truth as having eight aspects. And we've heard those repeated many times. They include right view and right conduct, right speech, right action, right effort. And it's important to understand that those eight aspects, when we use the term right, it's not in the sense of good and bad or good and evil. It's in the sense of the original word, which really means completion or togetherness or perfection, a kind of tightness or coherence something that is complete and pure and whole. So right view is a view or a way of seeing which is complete, which encompasses everything. It doesn't mean that one sees 
with an exclusive eye, an eye that focuses only on certain details or on certain angles. This is not right view. Right view could be also interpreted as complete view or coherent view. It's something that has the sense of something that's been perfected, something that is ideal, something that, when it's complete, cannot be improved upon. So that form of view, or that form of rightness, is really inherent in all of the eight steps of the path. To have complete view, to have complete action, to have complete effort. And when we study a little further in the teachings of the Buddha, we see that he taught practical steps in order to achieve those eight aspects of the path. He says in one sutra, from skillful understanding proceeds purity of thought. And understanding in this sense, we always relate to the Kabbalah. And we relate that to that logos, Bina, which is related to understanding or intelligence. And of course, Bina is the Holy Spirit, which is related with fire. So real understanding, real knowledge, is a product of fire. It's a product of work. That fire is what manifests purity of thought. That fire of the Holy Spirit, the fire of the third logos, is also called kundalini. And that kundalini, when it's arising, when it's awakening, is what fecundates purity of thought. And without that fire, purity of thought is next to impossible. From skillful thought, says the Buddha, proceeds purity of speech. Of course, we know that speech, as we discussed in another lecture, is a manifestation of what we already have inside. What we speak reflects what we think and what we feel. And if we say something that we do not believe, we are a liar. Moreover, if we say something that is not true, Even if we believe it, we are a liar. So to have pure speech or complete speech or right speech requires skillful thought or right thinking, which of course is dependent upon that fire. In like manner, from speech proceeds purity of action. And from pure action proceeds purity of livelihood. Action is a very important key element in these studies. And the, the action that one can undertake, of course, is not limited to physical action. A thought is an action. A feeling is an action. So from the Buddha we see that there is an intimate relationship between understanding, thought, speech, and action. And right action, or complete action, is always modified and managed by the law of karma. That law, of course, states that for every action, there is a consequence. So we know very well when we study Gnosis that to know and to enact pure action requires effort. It requires knowledge. It requires understanding. It requires great mindfulness. And truthfully, the basis of all of the steps of the Eightfold Path is mindfulness itself. And mindfulness, we know, is simply the awareness of what we're doing. To be aware of ourselves from moment to moment and to be conscious of what we do. You cannot have right speech without mindfulness. And you cannot have right thought without mindfulness. You cannot have right view. So it's fundamental and vital 
to learn and understand, practically speaking, daily, moment to moment, what is mindfulness? What does it mean to be aware? What does it mean to be cognizant, to be conscious, to perform what we call in Gnosis self-observation and self-remembering? A great question that many of us have, that something immediate and something that many of us sweat over and struggle over and cry over is right livelihood, knowing how to live, knowing what to do with one's life, with one's time. And of course, our culture provides many opportunities, many different avenues, many ways in which to use our time and our energy. And daily, constantly, we're being presented with examples. And all those examples are presented to us with the hope that we will imitate them. So we watch television, and we watch shows about people who have different kinds of jobs, different kinds of careers. And there's always this flavor that if we imitate this person, we will be happy. And so we have television shows and movies which concentrate and focus on certain types of careers and show them to be very honorable and very fruitful. And it's sort of a mystery why certain types of livelihood receive praise and other types are ignored. But in terms of our spiritual development, we can't really look to our culture and to our media for examples of what is right livelihood. Now, right livelihood is definitely one of the steps of the Eightfold Path. And it happens to be the fifth, which for those of you who know the Tarot and the Kabbalah, will immediately recognize that the number five has a very significant relationship with right livelihood. <clears throat> the number five is closely related with the law of karma. And it's also closely related with the being. In Buddhism, in the scripture in which the Buddha explains the eight steps, he says, and what monks is right livelihood? There is the case where a disciple of the noble ones, having abandoned dishonest livelihood, keeps his life going with right livelihood. This monks is called right livelihood. Sort of a brief and not very revealing answer. But it does say something really important. We find our right livelihood by abandoning dishonest livelihood. So the key, according to the Buddha, to finding our right livelihood is in sincerity, to have sincerity. Or in other words, honesty. And if you examine and study any of the great teachers of Buddhism from any tradition, they all pretty much agree about what livelihood is not. And they will tell you that dealing in weapons, dealing in slavery and prostitution and poisons and toxicants, all of these are wrong livelihood. And in essence, they all say, anything that is dishonest or harmful to others. So, obviously, this creates a great contradiction in comparison with our modern culture. A large percentage of the jobs that we admire, jobs that we aspire towards, the types of careers that we think about require 
deceit. They require hypocrisy and treachery. Trickery. And I'm sure that any one of us could come up with examples that would illustrate that. To find one's own true vocation requires that we abandon dishonest livelihood. And that really begins with the mindfulness of who we are and what we're doing. The term vocation comes from the Latin word vocare, which means to call. And so we use the word vocation as a calling, something we feel called to. And actually, if you look it up in the dictionary, you find definitions something like a strong feeling of being destined or called to undertake a particular type of work. And it's often related to something religious or spiritual. And of course, in Gnosis, we fully embrace that. The Master Samael on Vior stated very clearly that every, purpose, every person has a purpose to serve in life. Meaning that every person has a vocation, a calling. You could use the word destiny if you want. But this vocation is more or less a mission or a place, a seat, a role to fill. But unfortunately, because of the ego that we each have, because of our desire, because of our fear, we tend to not find that vocation. And instead, we listen to our fear or to our pride. And we try to find some, torp- some, si- some position or place in life that will satisfy that fear or that pride. So rather than discovering our own calling, we seek to find security. Could be financial security, could be social. Could be security with our family. Could be security in our community. Many of us look for work not from a sense of what is right, and what is natural to our own being. But we look instead based on envy because we want what someone else has. And of course, all of these approaches are wrong. But sadly, most people work and toil and slave driven by envy, by fear, and by pride. Now, with the exception of someone who's completely handicapped and limited, really every person has a purpose to serve. The difficult thing is finding that purpose. Really, the most important thing in life is to know oneself. And if one is approaching that knowledge and acquiring that knowledge, then one's place in life goes hand in hand. Inasmuch as we know ourselves, we know our place. We know our work. We know our vocation. There's no quick fix to finding your vocation. There's no career book. There's no college course. There's no job aptitude test that you can take that will definitively give you your vocation. I'm sorry, I wish it were otherwise. I wish I could tell you to go and find this one test or talk to this one person and they will tell you what your role in life is to be. It isn't that simple. Yet, finding that is of paramount importance. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to find someone who has discovered their vocation. And it's simply because it's difficult to find someone who really knows themselves. When someone is fully convinced of the role they have to play in life, they become a different kind of person. They become 
an apostle, a champion, a hero. It doesn't mean that they will necessarily be in the spotlight or that anyone will have any idea what they're doing. But the nature of their work and the nature of their energy is fully heroic. Whether they are a farmer or a tailor or a president. The type of vocation, the type of job is individual. It's the nature of the love that's put into that effort that distinguishes it. Whoever knows their vocation and discovers it does not, six, does not seek success, does not seek fame, does not seek money. We always look to the examples of the great artists and composers, great leaders, who, mysterious to us, were able to sacrifice absolutely everything for the love of their work. And we rightly admire that. And we can look to examples in history. We can look to Simon Bolivar. We can look to the Buddha. We can look to, to Jesus. We can look to Beethoven, to Mozart. To these persons who knew their role, who found through some opportune moment the place that they needed to act. And this type of person is fully satisfied by the joy of the work itself. There's no concern for money. There's no concern for titles. There's no concern for recognition. There's simply the love of the work. A friend of mine once told me, it's like a bee who makes honey. That's just what the bee does. The bee does that because that's what the bee does. And really, that's what one's vocation is. It is just what we do because that is what we do. There's no reasoning there's no justifying. It is what we do. It is in our heart to do it. And with that is the willingness to do it at any cost. The love of the work for the person who has found their vocation is so great that they're willing to withstand any obstacle any difficulty, any burden. Now that's a defining characteristic because the ego does not like that. The ego wants things to come easily and to become accompanied with money, with fame, with recognition, with respect. And, most especially, the envy of others. With sincere introspection, we can examine our own interests in life and discover that many of our interests, we have them because we want to be good at that so that others will envy us. We want to be successful so that others will be jealous, so that we can show ourselves, so that we can be respected and admired. And this is pure ego. It's pride. And upon that basis, there can be no true vocation. Because the true vocation is the calling of the essence. It's the calling of the consciousness. It's the work of the being. And that work cannot be performed where the ego is present. The ego, in synthesis, hates our vocation. Well, this deserves some reflection. If we're so enmeshed in our own ego and so protective of our ego and so enslaved to our desire, how can we possibly find a vocation? If on a day-to-day -day basis we look for situations to make our ego feel good, then how will we find our real work? We can't. We have to develop the willingness to contradict 
the ego itself, which is an internal battle, which is painful. To go against the impulses of your own mind is not simple. Moreover, it can't be accomplished in one day. It can't be accomplished simply by reading a book or hearing a lecture. To really make headway against the current of life driven by karma and desire requires tremendous willpower. But it's willpower rooted in sincerity and honesty with oneself. The sense of vocation, when we discover it, corresponds in an absolute way to our true destiny, our true calling, and gives us the capacity, almost with a sense of ease, to withstand any type of infamy and treachery and slander. When one is performing one's vocation, slander becomes like leaves in the wind. Treachery and betrayal become games which have no meaning. The love of the work is so great. There's no obstacle that one cannot overcome. In synthesis, that vocation is not accompanied by a desire for power. Instead, it is accompanied by a love for humanity. The person whose vocation, whose true calling is to be a baker will bake for the love of baking and for the love of giving those goods to others. And such joy comes to that person when his customers enjoy what he makes. And they will. Because those goods, the bread, the rolls, are filled with the energy of that baker's love for his work. And this is what makes the difference. People can sense it. And I'm sure we all have examples of places we've been, things we've seen, food that we've tasted that is different. Two different people can prepare the same recipe, but the food will be different. And it's vastly different when the cook is performing their vocation, their real calling. And this is true of any type of career, any type of job. There's no one vocation that's better than another because each person has their own. There is no career that is superior to another career. As much as our culture would hate to hear that. Because, of course, nowadays, there are certain types of jobs that we admire and certain types that we spit on. And that's wrong. If one's vocation is to collect trash, that is a beautiful service to humanity. And if one's vocation is to clean toilets, likewise, an irre in irreplaceable job, a vital and important job. Being president is no better. Being a CEO is no better. Being a famous artist is no better, particularly if it's not really your vocation. There are people who we admire because we think they do a great job. But do we know it's their vocation? You can begin to see it when you measure what they do by how it benefits humanity. And upon that measure, I think we'll find very few people who are in their vocation. There are some we can find who are clear examples, good examples. Gandhi. 
Now, the example of Gandhi is very clear. As a young man, he was living in South Africa, studying law. And he was presented with a situation one day where some of his countrymen were being discriminated against and abused. And sensing the injustice of that, he leapt into it at great cost to himself and defended his fellow men and performed a great service for them without really any regard for his own well-being. And if you read his story, you'll see what I mean. And in that instant, he discovered his vocation. And from that time on, for the rest of his life, he worked tirelessly for the well-being of his fellow men. Now, the beauty of what he did is not as much in his service to his fellow Indians, but also in his service to those who were perceived as his enemies. Because he adopted an approach which was also serving those who were abusing his fellow men. And talk about something difficult to do. He didn't simply take up arms to kill the British or to humiliate them. He sought a way to benefit them all, and he achieved it. At great cost, with great sacrifice, but with tremendous love. Now that is not to say that all of us should become Gandhi. But it means that to find vocation is to look in the course of one's own life, not to look outside, not to look in a book or a college, but to look in the circumstances of today. Where is there a need? Where is there injustice? Where is there suffering? How can you help? What can you offer? And by asking those questions, you can find your vocation. Those questions are not based on money or on fame or on recognition. They come from a place of love. And of course, the ego doesn't like that. And naturally, the ego will say, well, how will I make a living? How will I pay my rent? How will I eat? If I go and do this job, whatever that may be, how will I survive? And most of us listen to that. And that's tragic, because that's just fear. It's the way the ego manipulates us to keep feeding it. To find one's vocation requires courage. The courage to take risks. The courage to contradict what we are supposed to do. What our parents think we should do. What our friends think we should do. Instead of seeking more, more money, more power, more fame, we seek service, how to serve. Really, the ego seeks more. It seeks to feed itself. So in the normal job track, the career path of most people, what they seek is an easier job and more money, a better title and more respect. Convenience, pleasure, self-satisfaction. The ego does not ask, how can I be of service? How can I improve the lives of others? So when we follow the mechanism of the ego and we seek more money and more projects and more fame, what is the result? I'm sorry to point out that when we follow that mechanism of more, we become more hypocritical. We become more dishonest. We become more cruel and more merciless. 
And that's because the ego, seeking to feed itself, does so at the expense of others. If you examine our modern economics and the ideas and dreams that suffuse our culture, we have this idea that there is a way to get rich quickly and without much effort. And we believe that we deserve it. What we fail to realize is that as much as we gather, we take away from someone else. Who realizes that? Does the man who's accumulated a billion dollars realize that he has taken that money from someone else? Does the salesman who fights and lies and deceives to get more money realize he's taking it off the table of a family? Does the CEO realize when he's cruising on his million dollar yacht that all of the money that goes to buy and support that pleasure comes at the expense of others. And I would suggest that he does not. And I would suggest that the moment he thinks about it, he turns away from that thought because he cannot bear it. This is called insincerity. It's insincere, and it's dishonest, and it's very sad. And this is the basis upon which our society rests. This is why we have what we call the haves and the have-nots. I'm not suggesting any form of communism. I'm not suggesting any kind of revolution economically. I'm suggesting that we as human beings become more honest and more sincere and more aware of what we're doing. If you observe our culture, you can see how we've taken all the vast possibilities of work, the many types of jobs that are possible for people to do, and we've given them to machines. And thus, the people who would naturally find their vocation as a farmer, as a seamstress, as a craftsman, have nothing to do because they cannot survive. So they become what? Salesmen, buyers and sellers. They become cogs in a machine which does not care about their vocation. The machine only cares to make more money and have more power. We wonder why our society is coming apart at the seams. And truly, the sense of vocation is at the heart of the problem. Human beings, not knowing their vocation, are forced into jobs and lifestyles which humiliate them and sap them of all enthusiasm for right action. Our society is like a machine with all the parts in the wrong places. The man who should be president is working as a janitor. And the man who is president should be a janitor. Everybody is in the wrong place because they don't know their true vocation. We're all flopping about like fish on the shore, unable to breathe, unable to act, unable to move, and terrified. The chaotic state of our humanity is truly horrifying. And no one is happy because they do not have their true vocation. 
and jobs that offer a little security and a little money are overwhelmed with applications. And none of those people really should be doing that job. But they have no choice. People are in places that do not correspond to them. And the result is that our society is a failure. People are unhappy. The happiness that we find in work is transient and brief. And usually it's only based in having a brief sense of security or moments of feeling powerful. And the rest of the time, we're consumed with doubt and discouragement. More than that, when we find ourselves in a position that does not correspond with our vocation, we end up exploiting others. When craving power, craving money, craving fame, we seek to acquire those things on the backs of other people. How do you become famous? How do you become rich? You can't do it by yourself. You do it because other people put you there. And so how do you achieve that? If you read any of the books in the business section, they may have pretty words, but they all say essentially the same thing. You get your money from somebody else. And you do it by being very clever. The answer to this problem is to find one's vocation, to find what the Buddha called right livelihood. And of course he said, to find that, you have to abandon dishonest livelihood. And that dishonesty is really with ourselves. We have to stop lying to ourselves. There are three ways to find a vocation. The first is by discovering that we have a special capacity. Some skill or ability which is natural. We may have more than one. We may have many skills. And the vocation will encompass them all. The mind cannot find that. The intellect cannot find it. But the heart can. The second is by recognizing an urgent need. In the case of Gandhi, we see that he found an urgent need and he answered it. And in that moment, he discovered his vocation. He found his work. And he was a great service to humanity for that. And third is through guidance. This is very rare. Guidance can come in many forms. Some people have been very lucky to have the guidance of a loving parent. So we can look to the case of Mozart. Now, his father may be criticized, but nonetheless, his father recognized in his son tremendous talent, and his father loved him and sacrificed so his son could blossom, and Mozart did blossom in his vocation. Can you imagine if that young boy had had a different parent? We would have never have heard that music. What a tragedy that would be. And on the other side of that coin, how many beautiful works have been left uncreated because the parents were unable to guide the child to their true vocation? Why does that happen? Primarily because the parent seeks to live through their child their own desire. The parent, dissatisfied with their own accomplishments, their own sense of 
being important or important in life or fulfilling their own needs, their own desires, seeks to impregnate their own child with that desire. So the parent who failed to become a doctor or a lawyer demands that the child becomes a doctor or a lawyer. And the child may have no interest, may have no skill, no aptitude for that at all. And yet, because of pressure, because of fear, because of pride, and because of imitation, the child goes on to be a very unhappy doctor or lawyer. This type of guidance is very rare. It could come from a teacher. It could come from a friend. Most of us need to look at the first and second sources for inspiration. To look at our own natural capacities, our own natural skill, and to combine that with an urgent need. And in that way, discovering one's vocation becomes a matter of patience. We find it in accordance with our karma and our effort. Karma, of course, modifies everything. If we owe, we don't deserve to have our vocation right now, then we won't. We have to be patient. But the more we inspect ourselves, the more we look into our own hearts and minds, the more we know about ourselves the more prepared we will be when that moment arises. When the moment comes and the urgent need presents itself, we will be prepared to act. Because we know ourselves. We know what we can do. We know what we're capable of. In the very beautiful book called The Way of the Bodhisattva, or The Way of Life of the Bodhisattva by Shantideva. He writes that the forces that secure the good of beings are aspiration, firmness, joy, and moderation. And really these four apply directly to our vocation. Uh The first one is aspiration. The second one is firmness. The third is joy. And the fourth is moderation. Aspiration is that craving or impulse of the essence, the longing of the soul to know itself. If any of us who are investigating Gnosis, who are studying Gnosis, have that. Because without that aspiration, we wouldn't be here. So students of Gnosis have aspiration. They have the calling, the longing of the soul to know itself. But that knowing, that aspiration, is a as a longing for action, a longing for expression. And that is the essence itself. The essence is an energy. The consciousness is a conduit through which the being will express his own idiosyncrasy. And what that means is that each of us has a vocation which corresponds directly to the idiosyncrasy of our own being. Our being has a vocation. The being doesn't just float in space. The being works. The being is active. The monad is energy, action. It is not something passive, some idea, something vague. The being is an agent of change. And so the being that we have is related to a ray. And we know there are seven primary rays. And each ray has its own 
tendency or its own qualities. So the ray of Saturn, the ray of death, stimulates and feeds certain types of vocations. For example, to work in a funeral home. Now we in our culture tend to not deal with that and to think people who work in funeral homes are creepy. They're not. They're people. And the being who's related to the ray of Saturn may have that skill to work with the forces of death, which are important. As, as important as birth. Equal on either side of that scale. And so the vocation, the true calling, which works with the ray of death, should be admired and seen as equal with all other vocations. Likewise, related to the fourth and fifth rays, we have military and courts. We have different types of careers that, as a spiritual person, we might condemn. But there is a ray related to politics. There is a ray related to the courts. There is a ray related to the military. And so vocations in those fields can be your true calling can be the place where you can serve humanity. And there's no shame in that. In fact, there is dignity. And this is one of the most important gifts that a vocation bestows upon a person. Dignity. This is not pride. Pride is a lie. A doctor can be very proud. That does not mean it's his vocation. A doctor, in his vocation, may be very humble, but be dignified because he's performing his true work. He's acting from the impulses of his own conscience and doing what must be done. That is dignity. And that is beautiful. So the aspiration for vocation, the aspiration for service, is a quality of the consciousness. Likewise, firmness. To be firm is to be resolute, to be defined. It doesn't mean that one should be stiff. One can be firm and flexible. If you look at a Chinese sword, they use a type of sword in, in certain uh, forms of martial arts in China. The sword will bend, which is a very unusual thing to see. But that flexibility is a form of firmness, which is deadly in that case. And likewise, in the sense of our own consciousness, we must be firm but flexible, adaptable but unwavering. Really, water has the same quality. What force can resist the flow of a, of a river? A stone, which is very hard and very firm, placed in front of the river will be dissolved. At first, the, the river will go around it. It will be flexible. But its persistence will wear the stone away. That is firmness. And we need that same quality in our daily work. That work on ourselves, which will reveal our vocation. And saying that, it's worth pointing out. Your vocation may not be your job. Think about that. You may get a job in order to finance your vocation. Right? Don't expect that your vocation will give you a paycheck. It may not. You may have to get some kind of a job to finance your real work. There's nothing wrong with that. As a matter of fact, if you find yourself in that situation, you may discover that the job 
is a matter of course. It's just a job. And it can become a pleasure when it's financing your real vocation, your real work. Joy is also a quality of the consciousness. And that joy is natural. When you do what you know you should do, joy arises. It can't be forced. But that joy is the joy of doing it. The joy of doing what feels right and is natural. And it's the joy of seeing the fruits of that work. Now the tricky part here is that Krishna said we should work without concern for the results, which is true. In a real vocation, we do it for the sake of working. The Master Samael and Vior wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote till his fingers were decayed and falling apart. It was painful to type a key, but he kept doing it because he loved it. He was expressing the love of his being for humanity. And he received the pleasure and joy of doing the work and the pleasure and joy of seeing how it benefited others, but he didn't do it for that reason. He didn't do it so that he would feel pleasurable, so that he would feel good about it. He just did it because that's what he did. There's a little distinction there. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was a great writer and poet, said that each man has his own vocation. His talent is his call. There is one direction in which all of space is open to him. And this is true. The one who's realizing vocation is irreplaceable and is in a position to express that to the infinite degree and cannot be competed with. There's no competition in vocation because there's no one else that can do what you can do. It is your vocation, your unique place, which bears the mark and stamp of your own being. There's no one to compete for that spot except yourself. There's no one to step over. There's no one to conquer except yourself. And as such, there is an infinite range of expression which is before that person before you. It is your own unique way. And that is inspiring. To know that that track is there. And knowing that and experiencing that produces joy. The fourth quality is moderation. Moderation is also a quality of the consciousness. Even in one's vocation, one needs to rest. Even in one's vocation, one needs to know how to perform it. One needs to be very smart, very intelligent, very careful. Just to have a vocation does not give you license to do anything. The true definition of your vocation is to fulfill destiny and calling which is a series of steps, a series of action that has to be performed in the right way. That means that we have to moderate our enthusiasm and enact it with patience and intelligence. Now, these four qualities are obviously qualities of the consciousness. And by reflecting on them, they can help us to define our own vocation. And I mean that in the sense that when you look at your own natural inclinations, you look at the things that you're interested in, consider those things in relation to your aspiration, in relation to your own firmness to perform that work. If you find that it isn't natural for you to do it, 
then maybe that isn't your vocation. But if it's something that you just want to do for the sake of doing it, then you should look carefully at that because it may lead you to something important. The other important factor is that the ego will do everything it can to dissuade you. The person who feels the calling in their heart to be a painter will look at our modern culture and say, what is the point? There's no job for a painter. There's no career. There's no money. There's no way to make a living. And so that person will listen to that fear. I won't be able to survive. I won't be able to live. People will laugh at me. They'll criticize what I paint. And that person will end up being a teller or a clerk in a store and unhappy. The vocation, that sense of doing, the real drive can overcome those obstacles, but not if we listen to the ego. If we listen to the ego, if we listen to our pride and fear, the vocation will be abandoned. And it was Honoré de Balzac, the French writer, who said something like, um, the vocation that we abandon will bleed over the course of our entire life like a color. And this is true. We will always wonder, why didn't we do it? Why am I not doing that? Why did I abandon that longing? And that is a door to tragedy. A life unfulfilled. Nietzsche said, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. When you have vocation, you will find a way. When you know your vocation, you know your work, how becomes irrelevant. There's no how, we'll find it. That's what vocation says. There's no way, we will find it. That takes courage. So remember in the beginning, I said courage and sincerity. Very important. In the book of Ephesians, St. Paul gives us some really important clues about vocation. It's subtle. But I'll read you this chapter. It's chapter 4. Paul writes, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So thus far we see all of us have vocation and we should live worthy of that vocation knowing that that is a gift that we're given. Furthermore, he writes, wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now he's saying here, of course, that 
we are given guidance. And the guidance comes in levels. Some are apostles, some are teachers. But all of the teachings are given for the perfecting of the Sangha, the community, the body. And he continues, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness wherein they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, making, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So it's clear that by us receiving the teachings, learning gnosis, learning about ourselves, overcoming our limitations, we discover our vocation. We discover our real work. And we, in turn, become a more conducive part of the body of the Sangha. The, the parts of the body begin to fit together better, which makes for a stronger humanity and a stronger church. And by church, I mean universal. This entire humanity. He continues, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. And this is what we all do. With dark understanding and alienated from our own being, we work in blindness of the heart. We ignore our true feelings. And we give ourselves into unclean work with greed. He continues, But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye pit on the new man, which, after God, is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry not, and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed into the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. This is a very powerful indication and statement about vocation and the way to arrive at knowing that and acting upon it. The basis of discovering that vocation and performing the work that Paul indicates is mindfulness. We have to be mindful constantly without rest. Even when resting, we should be mindful. But most of all, in action, any kind of action, brushing our teeth, taking a walk, 
preparing food, helping the hungry. We need to be very mindful of what we're doing and question our action. Stop and cease all action which is harmful to others and seek to increase all action which is beneficial to others. Shantideva writes that at all times and in any situation, mindfulness will be my constant habit. This will be the cause whereby I am, whereby I am to meet with teachers and fulfill the proper tasks. So the discovery of vocation is based upon compassionate action with mindfulness. If we begin today to mindfully observe each action we perform and to measure that action, is this truly beneficial? Is what I'm doing harmful or helpful? And the more we can measure that, the closer we become to that moment when vocation is revealed. Those who master this way of living are called bodhisattvas. The bodhisattva has renounced self-interest and has dedicated himself to the benefit of humanity. That is not arrived at in a day. And it is not arrived at merely by intending good things, by having good intentions. It is arrived at by performing right action, by knowing and defining in oneself what that is. This type of person makes every activity a service to humanity. As mundane as the activity may be, it can be of service if the attitude is proper, is right, is complete. Shantideva writes as well, like those who take great pleasure in their games, the bodhisattvas in their every deed feel the greatest joy, exhilaration, and pleasure that will never fade or pass. When one is performing one's vocation, there is tremendous joy. But that's not the reason the vocation is performed. If we seek the vocation because we want to be happy, this is okay. But it's very limiting because that can become ego. But when we transcend that and the vocation becomes an expression of how to help others, that is true vocation. And that can be in the form of any type of job, any type of action. And it may appear with many different faces. It can even appear harmful on the surface. But in the heart, under the guidance of the being, it is vocation. So by fighting against our own selfish desires, by knowing ourselves, by stopping ourselves from being dishonest and insincere, by being mindful of our moment-to-moment -moment activities, we begin to go against the selfish desires that rule our own mind and heart. And every time we do that, we reduce suffering. It may not feel like it. Sometimes it can feel worse. But surgery can be painful, but necessary. Fighting against those desires and performing right action, we begin to establish real peace in ourselves. And those right actions begin to spread peace around us as well. That peace can grow when we realize that our every action can be of benefit to others. And we would work, when we work on ourselves and work on behalf of others, that peace blossoms in us. Shantideva wrote one last thing which well defines vocation. He said, 
I don't know if it's lichen or lichen, the stuff that hangs in trees. How do you pronounce that? I don't even know. What? Lichen? Something like that. I don't even know how to say it. But anyway, the quote's beautiful, even if I say it wrong. The lichen hanging in the trees wafts to and fro, stirred by every breath of wind. Likewise, all I do will be achieved, enlightened by the movements of a joyful heart. That is vocation. So, are there any questions? Okay. Very good. <laughs> Starting to get used to that. <laughs> Your ego has to be sacrificed as a no cause to your vocation. That's right. What was that? The ego, in order to find vocation, you have to sacrifice the ego. That means that the desire that we have for fame or power or pride or to be envied has to be sacrificed which is painful, because we built that pride. We built that envy. We built that craving. And the ego holds thy neighbor as thyself. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's not easy. The other thing that's, that's often the case when one finds vocation is that the person who is living and fulfilling their own vocation is almost universally attacked, envied, criticized. That's very difficult. But the very Longing to fulfill vocation will overcome that. But it can provide some, uh, some challenges as well. How do you find uh, what ray you're under? Raise your eyebrows. If you want to know your ray, raise your eyebrows and count the lines on your forehead. That will tell you. It's not a joke. <laughs> How does that yeah, we, there are seven fundamental rays, and the Master Samael wrote in the book The Seven Words that if you raise your eyebrows, you can count the lines on your forehead, and you'll have between one and seven. And that's the correspondence to your ray. To explain each number one is? It's in the books, and it's on the website. And each ray has its own qualities, but you can't define yourself just on those words. And the reason is this. Beethoven, as an example, was a great musician and a great composer, but he was not from the ray of art. So don't think that when you know your ray that you will know your career or vocation. You won't. It's not that simple. It can help you because it will show you a general tendency. It's qualities. It's qualities. So, you know, you can be from the ray of mercury, the mind, related to science and medicine, but be an artist. And there are artists who belong to that ray. Likewise, there are people who belong to the ray of Venus, related to the arts, who are scientists and doctors. It's not as simple as it appears. There are great physicians from the ray of Mars. Right. Right, great surgeons from the ray of Mars. But the ray of Mercury is related to medicine, not Mars. So there's, there's not a distinct limitation that your job will directly correspond to your ray. It's just that the ray imparts certain qualities and tendencies. But it will manifest differently with each person. But also, just because those people are doctors or physicians, for example, in the ray of Venus, that doesn't mean that's their calling either. That's true. It doesn't, yeah, exactly that. That just because you're a doctor does not mean you're from the ray of Mercury. 
and it doesn't even mean that's your vocation. Exactly. So your vocation is the idiosyncrasy of your being that will express through your consciousness. If we only have 3% free consciousness, how much chance do we have to really know our vocation? Much less to find ourselves mechanically performing it. Not much. So to acquire vocation is a matter of work, not a matter of chance. I have a question. Here too. Okay. So you have the same vocation in all your incarnations? Vocation is, re is related to the being. The being is from one ray and will never change it. So that idiosyncrasy or that quality of the being is eternal. The vocation is the destiny or job or role of that human soul. In its essence, in its synthesis, it will remain the same, but it can wear different suits. It can perform different tasks in different times. So for example, the Master Samuel and Vior performed different functions. He performed different types of work, which on the surface may look different, but in their essence they were his vocation. So he was a teacher, he was a writer, he was a lecturer, he was a guide, he was a healer. He did a lot of different things, but they were all part of his vocation. Paracelsus is another example. Other great initiates who performed many different types of work as scientists, philosophers, writers, farmers, and all related to their vocation, all as an expression of their own intimate quality. So you can't just say, well, I am a blank, because that isn't the case. The being is a vast intelligence who's capable of manifesting in many ways. And when you manifest that force of the being, that is vocation. That can come out in different ways. And it may come out in many ways at one time. You may perform many different functions, and they can all be sprouted from vocation, your own calling. That's, yeah, that's a very good point that your vocation will manifest according to circumstances. So as circumstances change, your role will change. That was my question, actually. Um, you know, we're presented in life with opportunities, right? And a certain opportunity develops certain abilities within us, mm -hmm. which can bring us closer to realizing those strengths that pertain to our vocation. So certain jobs may come up that help us to develop that or to realize that because we may not even realize we have certain abilities until that opportunity presents itself. Yeah, it's an excellent point. The, the comment has made that circumstances and situations will arise in life that help us learn our vocation and teach us things that we need to know. And in my own case, this is undoubtedly true. I've had many different types of jobs, all of which I suffered in. But with time, with experience, I've come to realize that every one of them taught me something that I now use and is very helpful to me. So in a way, none of that experience was wasted. And now as my circumstances change and as my life situation is you know, moving from one set of circumstances to another, I'm bringing some of those skills to bear to help me and the work I need to perform. And I'm also learning new things, which I will need now and tomorrow. So the, the real lesson in that for me is learning to be adaptable and to take advantage of all situations, to take advantage of circumstances. And that's really a foundational thing in Gnostic psychology, to take advantage of adversity, to not avoid just because something is painful or difficult, but to learn from it, take something from it. I'll give you another example. There was a man who uh, I heard about who was a Gnostic instructor, 
who was wealthy and well connected. And incidentally, vocation uh, doesn't necessarily have anything to do with money. Same with gnosis. You can be rich or poor, it's irrelevant. But this man happened to be wealthy and happened to be well connected politically and in business. But a new set of circumstances arose where, likely due to some internal process, he became widely criticized and condemned. And as such, all of his connections were lost, and somehow he managed to lose his fortune. So he was left penniless and friendless. So in order to support himself, he began to, uh, he opened a shop and began to print books, which was a skill he learned when he was a young, young man. So by the time this happened, he was much older. And in that, he realized that everything that he went through, even learning how to print books when he was young, at the time he thought it was a pointless thing to learn, but it later saved his life. And I can say in my own case, the same is true. There were things that I learned when I was younger, which now uh, are absolutely vital to what I do. But at the time, I complained. <laughs> you know, I was very unhappy knowing and doing those things. But now they're, they're very essential. So it's, it's interesting how the combination of karma and the will of the being can interrelate in order to provide us with the, the skills and tools that we need to find our vocation. You know, everything doesn't exist just to make us suffer. Even suffering itself is there to teach us something. So when we realize that, we can take advantage of it and not just become bitter. Are there other questions? Okay. Anything else? Okay, that'll be the end then. Until next time, thank you all. <laughs>